Thank you so much uh, to Jasmine Odom for um, that wonderful introduction. Um, I also want to thank Professors Meredith Clark Wiltz and Ali Fetter Harrett, um, the Convocation Committee, and um, welcome and thank you to President Tom Minor um, for inviting me to be here with you on this extraordinary occasion. More than a century ago, one of the 20th century's great intellectuals and activists, W.E.B. Du Bois, spoke out loud the question that so many white Americans had asked of him. How does it feel to be a problem? It was, Du Bois suggested, a strange, as in a curious experience. And in the collection of essays he called Souls of Black Folk, Du Bois meditated long and wide-rangingly on the problem of being black and American at the dawn of the 20th century. When in 1991, law professor Paulette Caldwell published her essay on being the subject of a law school hypothetical, she brought Du Bois's question very close to home for me. How might we speak, write, and teach in those moments when our very lives become the fodder of lawyers, courts, and case books. Caldwell, like Du Bois, saw in the question an opening, an opportunity to transform legal discourse, not by resisting the ways in which her life was intertwined with law. Instead, she saw an opening into what she might, in, an opening into what she might um, and then insert her own stories to restore nuance, contradiction, lived experience, and stakes in her own classroom. She was, of course, writing within an intellectual movement that came to be called critical race theory, an intellectual movement that expanded our ideas about legal storytelling, gave permission to some of us to start from the position of the self and with the aim of asking new questions and offering new answers. I began this piece as an homage to another of critical race theory's early thinkers, Patricia Williams, who was my teacher many years ago. Loving versus Virginia remains a powerful touchstone even today, nearly 50 years after it was decided. Nearly 50 years since the U.S. Supreme Court struck down anti-miscegenation laws, the oldest and most enduring reflections of the law's role in constructing race and racism, Loving still lives. For students of race and law, the 1967 case marks the toppling of Jim Crow's final pillar, coming behind Brown versus Board of Education, the Civil Rights Act, and the Voting Rights Act, for students of marriage, Loving offered an important precedent, legal as well as cultural, for proponents of marriage equality for gay and lesbian Americans. For people like me, Loving marks the moment when our families, families that transgressed law and the color line, became a legitimated, permissible, cognizable dimension of our national landscape. Loving said something powerful and new about our parents and the choices they had made about who to love and with whom to make a family. Still, Loving had all too little to say about us, those of us who were the children of those families, those of us who were said to be produced out of the crossing of color lines, out of the mixing of difference. If American legal culture had adapted well to the changes in marriage that Loving wrought, it has done less well, I'll suggest to you today, reconciling itself to the children of those marriages. So today, I'm asking myself, how does it feel to be a problem? Birth certificates. To be born in the United States in 1958, as I was, was to confront the color line. For my generation, race was a fact of birth, not unlike sex, weight, and length. Birth certificates, the state laws and agency regulations that set their terms, ensured that as infants we were scrutinized, surveilled, and otherwise held up against that measure of human difference that we call race. In these, our earliest encounters, 
with race, the designated agents of race making were physicians, often obstetricians, who completed a box, the one that might determine where we could live, go to school, or who we might marry. Were physicians suitable agents of racial determination? Well, courts have debated this at least as far back as 1939, when in an estate proceeding, the lawyers for the decedent's siblings proposed that a surgeon, one with extensive experience treating patients in the US South and then as a missionary in Africa, they proposed that he was an expert for the purposes of racial determination. The surgeon, quote, seemed to hold a very unique and peculiar position as an expert on the question involved from his work in life the California Court of Appeals explained. So it was in New York City, absent the drama of the courtroom, in the dark anterooms of OB wards, doctors checked boxes, circled choices, filled in blanks, and gave us, each of us, a race. I had, of course, no recollection of this moment. As a 19-year-old, though, preparing for study abroad, I worried more about rail passes and backpacks and a gift for my host family than I had about the paperwork. But preparing to secure my first passport, I finally had a first hard look at my birth certificate. The document lived in my parents' strong box and had many years before been folded into thirds, this reverse sort of copy, black background, white print on shiny, heavy paper with a raised health department seal evidenced my debut on the planet on June 22nd. And there were described my parents, their names, their ages, their places of birth. And I recognized them. My father, the Atlanta-born Southerner, eight years the senior of my mother, born and raised in Buffalo, New York. Amid all this data, one word had the power to stop me cold, and that word was white. Now, I knew my mother had long been a white person, or as we'd say in 21st century parlance, she was self-identified as such. But even in the 1970s, her whiteness figured more like a fact than a social construction. But finding my father and then myself designated white caused me to frantically scan the paper. Was this actually my birth certificate? If so, there had been a terrible mistake. My father was not white at all. He was black. I went to my mother, with whom I rarely spoke about such things. I worried that my passport application might be in jeopardy. It occurred to me that I might be denied this all-important document, or worse, subject to some penalty for perpetuating a racial falsehood. Had she noticed this, I queried my mother. What did it mean? She then recounted a story that I kind of knew well. My father had not been literally present for my birth at all. Now, from the perspective of the 1970s, a time when fathers coached and caught babies and cut umbilical cords, I needed reminding that in the 1950s, there were, while we were being born, uh, fathers were more likely sitting in waiting rooms, pacing linoleum corridors, or smoking cigarettes out on West 51st Street with which is with my Uncle Bobby. That's what my father was doing while I was being born. But my mother's point was that the doctor who completed my birth certificate never met my father. He never heard his colloquial drawl, never measured the flare of his nose, never shook his strong, wide brown hand. So the obstetrician who delivered me, my mother explained, had looked at her, looked at me, and assumed my father to be white. To think otherwise, she reflected, was... Well, unthinkable. Unthinkable in 1958 that a white girl from Buffalo had married someone other than a white boy. Unthinkable that her pink-brown newborn was anything other than white, too. I think I propose that we have the certificate amended. It was the sort of scheme my mother might have entertained, but I actually didn't have the nerve to follow through. I knew that neither designation, white nor black, was one I might easily or emphatically claim. And I had no alternative to offer up. Terms such as mulatto and octoroon, once part of official American racial parlance, were throwbacks without any late 20th century meaning. So I went ahead and got my passport and headed to Europe for the semester. As for the birth certificate, I hid it away like a secret, an artifact I regarded with confusion and even shame. My own sense of birth certificates were high, that birth certificates were high stakes um, 
was confirmed not too many years later in a Louisiana case brought by a woman named Susie Gilry Phipps. Ms. Phipps appeared before her county records office, like me on her way to securing a passport. When the clerk emerged from the storage room, document in hand, she called Phipps to the side in hushed tones, explaining that Phipps had African-descended forebears. Many years before, a local physician had marked her as colored. Phipps went in that moment from being a white person to a person without a vocabulary, without a scheme, without a construct that captured her family history or her identity. And she wasn't content to get her passport and simply tuck away the certificate. She sued the state of Louisiana over her claim to be a white person. Phipps argued that she had a property white in her whiteness and explained how the entirety of her life rested upon that fact. And while she would maintain her position through an appeal to the state's highest court, Phipps would be disappointed. Not only did Louisiana in 1985 uphold its state law that provided for racial distinctions among and between citizens, anyone who at least anyone who had at least one great great grandparent who had been black was black, not white. And Phipps herself was said to be three thirty seconds black, enough to support the physician's initial conclusion and the terms of her birth certificate. In one sense, in one sense, Phipps and I could not have been more different in our reactions. She had wanted to expunge any legal sign of blackness, while I had imagined I might restore it to the record. But we were in another sense very much the same. People for whom the state had but a very limited vocabulary. They couldn't describe us and categorize us in our own terms. We might be said to be mixed, but the taxonomy of the mid-20th century required we be squeezed into one box, and it was not always an easy fit. Fair housing. My family, as you gathered, was very mixed up. She was from the north, Buffalo, New York, a place of steel and prisons. He was from North Carolina, the small city of Greensboro, remembered for tobacco and later civil rights sit-ins. He was a child of the black bourgeoisie whose father had sent him to prep school in New England. She was of the working class, a high school valedictorian for whom social mobility meant working in offices rather than factories. She was a Catholic a pre-JFK Catholic who had only glimpsed Protestant kids from across some imaginary but very real line in East Buffalo. He was a Methodist with a bishop for an uncle, an uncle who refused to preside over their interfaith nuptials. They joked that it was this difference between Protestantism and Catholicism that was the great challenge of their marriage, but it wasn't true. He was black and she was white. And in 1956, when they met in New York City, nearly all while else was subordinate to this fact. They told their story in terms of love, um, not unlike the lovings. They also told a civil rights story. It was true, they confessed, that when they married a year later in 1957, their union was prohibited in more than 20 states, including his home state of North Carolina. When they proposed moving their small family, including me, from Harlem to the suburbs of New York City, they confronted a world shaped by the vestiges of Jim Crow, redlining, restrictive covenants, and recalcitrant neighbors. Once the bomb threats led up, we spent those early years in a sort of awkward isolation. My parents were regarded as pariahs, excluded from circles of sociability. We, their three children, were deemed regrettably mixed, but blameless unfortunates. Our circumstances mirrored the debates that would animate some parties in the case that became Loving versus Virginia. Yes, there were arguments that went to suggesting how the state should enjoy the latitude to regulate relations among and between adults said to be of different races. Still, the most compelling arguments in Loving turned on the children. Some claimed they were, that we, were inferior in a scientific sense. The biology, the blood, the genes of children born by way of unions between black and white Americans were said to be defective, fragile, and otherwise monstrous, as one court put it. In a social sense, we were said to be without a place, without a community. There were, if you will, no terms, no boxes, no categories that might account for us. We were, in the years before loving, unthinkable. 
After a bumpy start in the suburbs, my parents' home filled with very interesting people, artists, priests, teachers, social workers, and activists. Their lives were enmeshed in the era's movements for social change, anti-poverty, anti-war, civil rights. I drank it all in, like a creed, like a faith. And my father chaired the local anti-poverty organization and fought for the building of low-income housing in our town. He was especially interested in education, an interest he came by honestly. His father had been a college president. During my junior high school years, he spearheaded a local school desegregation lawsuit against our small suburban district. We had but one high school, but his grievance was not that. African American students were excluded, he observed. I mean, were not excluded, he observed. But he complained still that their graduation rates in a district where 95% of students went on to college, African American graduate rates were dismal. His charge was a sort of de facto segregation, not by the literal, literal physical separation of bodies along racial lines, but by virtue of the disparate outcomes. He collaborated with the NAACP, planned to file a suit. But when it came time to choose named plaintiffs who would represent the class of African American students, my name was not among them. I was, it seems, no Linda Brown, Linda Brown who had been the lead plaintiff and the face of Brown versus Board of Education. As a mixed race girl, my destiny would not include serving as the face of a school desegregation campaign. Still, I waited for my chance to continue the struggle in the tradition of my parents. And in the 1980s, I began law school, committed to continuing the struggles that had given our family meeting. An opportunity appeared my very first semester of law school. Word circulated through our classes that the local fair housing program was seeking testers. At stake were provisions of the 1968 Fair Housing Act and they needed volunteers to pose as prospective tenants and ferret out discriminatory practices by landlords and real estate brokers. It went like this. Black and then white testers would carry identical credentials, leaving race the only variable, um, and then document the disparate treatment between black and white um, apartment seekers. And I was elated. Um, this was precisely why I had come to law school. Finally, I could join the struggle on the front lines as a tester. And my classmates began to hurriedly sign up, too. But I hesitated. What sort of tester would I be? My hesitation turned into paralysis when I imagined the cross-examination at trial. Now, you have to appreciate this is sort of the grandiose reflections of a first-year law student. Everything becomes a grandiose trial. But nonetheless, I worried. Would I be asked my race? Wasn't that part of the prima facie case in a discrimination suit? Again, first-year law student throwing around Latin phrases. It's very important to your new identity. But what would I say when queried? How would I explain how I fit into a charge of discrimination and into an American taxonomy of race? Being mixed race, I concluded, was no asset to the cause. My classmates went off to change the world, and for a moment I just went home. Checking boxes. Each year, people in the U.S. are asked to complete a census form. At least, this is the case since 1970. Before that, census enumerators filled out those forms for us, and there are interesting stories about that. But here, today, uh, we're asked to report our race. The details have changed, but since the 1790s, the federal government has collected such data. New on the year 2000 census was a controversial provision related to respondents who had quote, origins in the peoples of more than one race. Prior to the year 2000, we could check only one box. But after that year, we were, for the first time, invited to check more than one. There were six broad categories from which to choose, white, black or African American, American Indian or Alaska Native, Asian, Native Hawaiians or other Pacific Islanders, and, quote, some other race. New in 2010 was our president. Barack Obama had been elected in between the two census cycles. He confronted those six boxes with the entire nation looking over his shoulder. 
our president, whose race had been debated by pundits all throughout the 2008 election campaign, confronted the question as starkly put by his own agency. Question nine, what is person's one, person one's race? Mark one or more boxes. Obama checked black. Perhaps it's not a surprise. If you've read his coming-of-age memoir, Dreams from My Father, you already know that the president self-identified as a black American. But he also reflected on the idea of miscegenation, a humped-backed, ugly word that pretends a monstrous outcome, he wrote. The word, Obama tells us, evokes images of another era, a past. Um, he says, when I celebrated my sixth birthday, it was then that the Supreme Court of the United States would finally get around to telling the state of Virginia that its ban on interracial marriages violated the Constitution. Loving versus Virginia, a touchstone in his personal story. However, that story does not foreshadow his conclusion. Um, his boy's search for his father led Obama to conclude um, that his search for what was for his life as a black American. For the future president, the way forward was not by claiming himself to be mixed race at all. Obama, we might say, opted out. He chose only one box. Still, he couldn't decide the question for millions of other Americans. We know that many opted in. In a 2010 census brief, the Bureau summarized the results. One heading reads, the overwhelming majority of the total population of the United States reported only one race in 2010. I've tried to discern the tone of this bureaucratic declaration. And I confess, I'm probably overreaching, but I'll tell you, it sounds a little bit like the agency is relieved. Perhaps this more than one box thing is not catching on, is under control. It's really confounding for their statistical purposes. Something about that overwhelming majority phrase suggested they're a little happy. In any case, the report goes on. People who reported more than one race numbered 9 million in the 2010 census and made up about 3% of the total population. 9 million people. What the Bureau leaves unremarked upon is what the accompanying table sets forth. This number increased 32% between the 2000 and the 2010 census. Rather than being under control, there was something like a demographic epidemic unfolding. Then, in a 23-page report, the Bureau devoted seven pages, more than a third, to analyzing the more than one box data. Perhaps, if the Bureau can label it, chart it, and otherwise contain it, the data might not be such a puzzle after all. Quote, most people who reported multiple races provided exactly two races in 2010. White and black was the largest multiple race combination, the agency warns. For more than a century, the tragic mulatto has been a stock figure in American popular culture. Most scholars date the emergence of the character to 1842 in a story titled The Quadroons by abolitionist writer Lydia Maria Child. Child heroine Rosalie was pious, obedient, domestic, beautiful, moral, and sensitive. She appeared to be an ideal, true woman, but her mixedness meant Rosalie would never marry the white man she loved. She was instead doomed to be unmarried, socially dead, even before her premature death. Such characters offered Americans, especially white Americans, a vehicle by which they might contend with the meanings of race, its relationship to slavery, emancipation, civil rights in the nation. The tragic mixed race figure was portrayed as despondent, even suicidal, subject to particular hardships, including the loss of family, lovers, and social status. She was inevitably, and she was often a she, isolated and misunderstood. Hence, tragic. In the late 20th century, commentaries surrounding changes in law have breathed new life into the tragic mulatto, and she is now in the company of many mixed race others. Some of this commentary is celebratory. The possibility of checking more boxes, um, designating more than one race, is lauded. A triumph of self actualization in American culture. We can express our true identities and cast off outdated thinking. Reading the census agency's fine print should, however, curb our enthusiasm. The census is understood by the state to be a vehicle for the collection of reliable 
and true data rather than an instrument of self-actualization. A review of the agency's regulations gives us a caution. Those who refuse or willfully neglect to answer to the best of their knowledge any of the questions on a census survey shall be fined more than $100, not more than $100. Those who willfully give any answer that is false shall be fined not more than $500. For example, the Bureau defines Native Americans as persons having origins in any of the original peoples of North and South America and who maintain tribal affiliation or community attachment. I don't check that box. I learned of these regulations while teaching a class on race and the census. I learn about them only after I've completed my 2010 return. I hurriedly search my memory. Which boxes had I checked? Uh, what was my best knowledge on that day? All I can remember is a long discussion with, about the census with my new husband, who is French. He objects to checking any box at all. He says in France such a question is illegal. In fact, in France such a question is unconstitutional. Besides, he thinks that white might be a pejorative designation. He's not sure. But I tell him it's white or nothing for him. He's got to check a box. And for good measure, you know, white stands for privilege in the U.S. And he should just go ahead and embrace it. But I can't remember my own state of mind on that day. Tragedy sort of rears its uncomfortable but familiar head. Not only can't I keep fixed my own boxes, I'm now liable to federal prosecution if I've gotten them wrong. Courts. Our courts have been more circumspect. Increasingly, appellate judges tell us that they've encountered a mixed race party though they fail to explain precisely what that means or how it might be germane in a proceeding. In Davis versus Prince George's County, for example, the Fourth Circuit tells us of a, quote, mixed race murder victim who had a confrontation with a group of African American men at a party just prior to being killed. We're left to wonder, was his being mixed race, did it have something to do with the confrontation? Was it just window dressing? Um, why did the court tell us that, and what does it mean? Judges, we know, hear stories, and they tell us about them, about the hardships to which mixed race individuals are subjected when they live in black neighborhoods, work alongside whites, and when they socialize with people not like them. Mixed race people seek asylum for fear of a particular, particularized form of persecution in their homelands. Mixed race people typically have the rarest marrow cell types, testing the constitutionality of the federal law's ban on compensation for human organs. Mixed race defendants cannot expect a jury of peers. As one judge put it, not an easy task when a party strikes a so-called light-skinned black or mulatto from the pool. In a California federal district court, the following exchange was reported to have, have taken place in print um, during that um, part of the trial voir dire when judges, the defense lawyers, and the prosecutors all uh, questioned jurors to determine their suitability to deliberate in the case. Here, um, a bit of context, federal law generally, federal case law generally, um, declines to um, parties um, a right to strike jurors from uh, jury uh, participation um, simply on the grounds of race. But here's the exchange. The defense counsel. There would be a challenge to the exclusion of juror 35. That is the second African-American, female African-American, that has been challenged by the prosecution, and I can't think of any reason why she should be excluded from the jury unless it's race-based. The court. I don't think she's really African-American myself. I think she's dark-skinned, but I really thought that she is, even though she has an American-sounding name, she almost appeared to me to be Indian-looking. I don't think she's African-American at all. So I will find that there's no prima facie case has been established under Batson and Wheeler. I don't believe that the people are exercising their preemptories in an insidious fashion. I'm not asking the people to respond, but for the purposes of the record, if the people would like to make a comment, you can make a comment. The DA. It didn't appear to me she was African-American either. It's the only comment I would make. Court, do you want to tell us why you excused her for the record or you don't want to? No. 
the court. Quite frankly, I was about 30 seconds from excusing her for cause based upon her personal predicament, but I really don't feel she's African American, so for the request at this point under Batson and Wheeler is denied. The presence, of an, the presence of an ambiguous mixed race person not only confounds the court's ability to reach a conclusion about what might underlie the striking of a juror, it provokes open speculation, as you've heard. Perhaps the court might have asked for the juror's birth certificate. Wink. Shooty. I didn't expect to find the specter of the mixed race person making an appearance in the April 2014 Supreme Court decision that upheld Michigan's ban on affirmative action. But there it was. In Schutte versus Coalition to Defend Affirmative Action, Justice Kennedy, writing for the plurality, cast doubt upon the court's capacity to deliberate over race cases, and mixed race people were said to be the culprits. Kennedy wrote that, quote, not all individuals of the same race think alike. Fair enough. But then he went on to suggest that mixed race people confounded the court's capacity to, to quote, define individuals according to race. He continued, quote, in a society in which those lines are becoming more blurred, the attempt to define race-based categories raises serious questions of its own. So, when we blur the lines, as mixed race people are said to do, are we really undermining the court's capacity to determine questions about the equal protection of the laws? W.E.B. Du Bois is once again apt. How does it feel to be a problem? Justice Kennedy's view feels eerily familiar. There is nothing new about regarding mixed race people as a problem in the United States, and Justice Kennedy adds just one more chapter to that long saga. We can trace this idea back to the earliest lawmaking in British colonial America. The first laws to regulate race were those that prohibited sex and marriage across the color line. This is the long history of loving. Lawmakers in 17th century Maryland, for example, began to fix the distinction between black and white by punishing freeborn English women from marrying enslaved men. Race and labor were becoming linked. At the same time, the law discouraged the birth of mixed race offspring who might confound a system in which fixing a person's race also fixed their status. In 19th century literature, as we've heard, the problem of mixed race people and the blurring of the color line entered into the literary canon. And in the 20th century, filmmaker D.W. Griffith offered up a brutal interpretation of how mixed race people might corrupt law and politics. His 1915 film, Birth of a Nation, examined the period just following the Civil War. Today, historians recognize this as a short but remarkable period, a period of interracial democracy in the United States. But for Griffith's interpretation, mixed race people were the bad guys. They were loyal only to one another. They used that loyalty to gain political influence by corrupt means. Power-hungry mulatto people threatened to impose their rule on the South, which for Griffith justified the rise of the Ku Klux Klan and the violent overthrow of Reconstruction. Lawmakers were not far behind Griffith and their partner in the 20th century about mixed race people was the pseudoscience of eugenics. The result was a spate of new anti-miscegenation laws in the 19-teens and 20s. The result there were these draconian criminalized uh, criminalization of mixed race uh, marriages across the color line. It was the instantiation in the 20th century of a one-drop rule that deemed persons with any black ancestry to be non-white. It was in part the defective character of mixed race children that justified these laws. Half-caste children were said to be physically inferior, psychologically disadvantaged, and socially unassimilable. Uh, unassimilable. Lawmakers and scientists agreed that such children put the well-being of the nation at risk. As my talk today suggests, Justice Kennedy's view is not merely a throwback. Kennedy is not alone, it seems, in being puzzled about how to regard mixed race people under law. 
lower federal courts have also resurrected the mixed race person as a problem view. The U.S. Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit, for example, explained how mixed race people could throw a wrench into this jury selection process that I described earlier. Jurors may not be excluded based solely on their race. Judges, the court explains, do not know how to answer the, quote, thorny question of whether litigants could discern the race of the jurors by observation alone. This is, quote, not an easy task, the court lamented, quote, when a party strikes so-called light-skinned blacks or mulattoes from the pool. So it is for Justice Kennedy. The court, in his view, does not know how to regard people who blur the lines, people whose racial identities do not conform to ideas of racial certitude, people who check more than one box. Are we entitled to seek equal protection of the laws? In Justice Kennedy's view, perhaps no. It's just too complicated. One last bit, Black Lives Matter. On the nation's front burner today is the movement we often term Black Lives Matter. Police violence, state violence more broadly, violence directed at those said to be black Americans are at the core of this movement. The confrontation, brutal and sometimes fatal, uh, between the state and black Americans play out in seconds. They emanate from judgments about race that are often unconscious, though not always. Mixed race people find themselves thrust back into the binary. Race is what we see. It is perception. In police encounters, some of us become again white, others of us again black, both on both sides regarded, regarded once again through that lens of the birth certificate, the census return, or even the musings of judges and lawyers. For me, uh, who is, and I have been, I like to think, an active organizer and commentator, um, ally in the movement that is Black Lives Matter, someone like me um, almost might be pushed to the edge of this moment. Um, should I place myself among the privileged um, those are perceived in those split-second encounters as white. Um, how do I assert in those split-second encounters that I'm something other than white? And even this is not a new story. Um, it takes me back to um, what Jasmine mentioned, my early years in the 1980s and 90s as a lawyer in New York City, not a professor at all, um, but this last story is rooted in a vacation, a vacation to Martha's Vineyard. Each summer, uh, for many years, I traveled to Martha's Vineyard, um, oftentimes with a cousin. And um, some of you may know that on the vineyard is a community called Oak Bluffs that has often been a, a destination, a haven for black Americans over many generations. It's a much desired and exciting vacation spot for black Americans, many of whom are there precisely to um, find respite from those kinds of encounters um, that Black Lives Matter uh, talks about. And my cousin Akosia and I often made this trip um, and in this particular summer, uh, we had with us Akosia's son, Walter, and his friend, Ian. And the boys were about 13 years old, um, but they were tall and handsome, and we joked they were sort of our beards. You know, we were going, we were single women, and we'd go out, but, you know, when we didn't want to be looking too much like single women, we'd take the boys with us, because they were both about six feet tall at 13, and, and they were great cover on the social scene at the vineyard. And we'd travel um, late overnight. We'd get in the car in Manhattan at midnight um, because we were always too disorganized to make reservations on the ferry that goes from Cape Cod to the vineyard. So the idea is you get in your car at midnight and you drive and you arrive at 4 or 5 in the morning and then you get in the standby line until you, know, you get your turn and you get on the island sometime by noon the next day. So we piled into my car, my Subaru, the boys in the back, Akosi and I in the front, and we travel up. The roads are quite 
uh, open at this hour um, through uh, Connecticut, um, Rhode Island on our way to Massachusetts. And as you cross into Rhode Island, um, you, there's a bridge, the name of which I can never recall, um, but there's a plaza and at night it's all lit up with floodlights. Um, and we're the only car coming across the plaza. And I'll say, I'm a kind of conservative driver, um, especially late at night. I'm pretty rule-bound, um, so I don't speed. Um, I don't change lanes without my blinker. But nonetheless, as we pulled onto the plaza and the lights flooded the car, a police cruiser pulled in behind us, um, and then within 15 seconds, um, the lights were going, and um, we had to pull over. Now, my friend Ocosia was like me, a lawyer, but with a different sort of temperament, which means as soon as he pulled, you know, the lights go on, she says, what is he doing? Why is he pulling us over? Roll down the window, and I'm going to tell him a thing or two about why is he pulling us over. I'm saying, gosh, Ecosia, um, chill out, right? Chill out, because I'm going to take care of this. But no, part of what's working in my mind is we're going to have one of those police encounters, and um, I need a strategy, right, for how to come through it unscathed. I don't think I'm going to get a ticket. I just don't know exactly what's coming. So I shush Ecosia, and I take down the window. I give over my paperwork, and the officer goes back to his car and does the typical thing. I guess he's running a check. And Akosia's in my ear. You know, when he comes back, I'm going to tell him he had no right to pull us out. I'm thinking, really, please don't do that. Um, and when he comes back, I put on my best face. Um, thank you, officer. Um, uh, yes, officer. I understand, officer. Thank you so much, officer. And he begins to back away from the window and then looks at me in the eye and says, you know, I pulled you over for your own safety. I pulled you over for your own safety. And that encounter has stuck with me. Um, one of those moments of misapprehension in the great adventure of American race. Um, but I understood then. He thought I was a white woman in a car of African Americans, including young men in the back seat. And that's why he had stopped us and pulled us over. I looked at him, said, thank you, officer, rolled the window, and we headed to Martha's Vineyard. Thank you all very much. Dr. Jones, I don't even know what words to utter after such a story, closing your talk. Uh, but what I will tell you is that you've woven a much stronger understanding for us of issues that are just critical to who we are as a society. And thank you very much again. Uh, Dr. Jones has uh, uh, agreed to take some questions from the audience and their microphone, ro roving microphones. The faculty have roving microphones. Thank you, thank, thank you very much for, your, for your, your presentation. I'm interested in the intersection of race and religion. Mm. What is the experience of mixed race young people or any people in the United States with the church, which is seen as, as so segregated? Thank you. It's a great question. Um, I mentioned that um, part of my family comes out of the Methodist tradition. And um, my great uncle, uh, Robert Jones, um, was a bishop, the first African American bishop in um, the Methodist church. Um, and much of his, and he was ordained in 1922. Um, and really all of his career was. Um, devoted, if you will, to the question of civil rights within um, what was in, then the Methodist Episcopal Church North, um, the years before the Southern and the Northern Church were reunited. So you might think, in some sense, that um, not only his faith, um, but the critique um, of his um, institution um, might have led him to um, 
be in a sense opening, uh, opening or welcoming to my parents. Um, but he was not, and I think that um, it was a moment in which um, we can see the limits um, what in the 1950s of a church like the Methodist Church North, the Methodist Episcopal Church North, um, in thinking in complex ways about right. He'd spent all his life right to make a place for black Americans, but couldn't quite envision um, a mixed race couple in his church. Now, my mother came from a Catholic tradition right, that did not have the kind of stark segregation um, within congregations and denominations. And her favorite story was really about how, um, in the years after she left Buffalo in the 50s, um, her East Side neighborhood transformed from a church that catered almost exclusively to German immigrants and their children and grandchildren, of which she was one, um, to an African-American community. Um, and when we would return there, the, the, the hymnals were wrapped in kente cloth. Um, and it was a place, um, in a, some sense, that we were um, welcome in a different way, um, precisely um, because of that. I think that um, in the Methodist Church, the last thing I'll say is that um, uh, this point didn't really, and this dilemma in the church really didn't fuel, hasn't really fueled a debate about, for example, marriage equality in the Methodist Church. I think it's kind of remarkable how, um, as a historian, I can say the ways in which the histories of our denominations and the struggles in our denominations over inequalities of all kinds um, can be um, lost in debates about the present don't really inform them. So that's a beginning of a thought. I hope that's helpful. Sure. Uh, I have a question. Uh, being mixed race, did you ever have any problems, you know, fitting in with your own communities? Did you pay any discrimination from within your own groups of being mixed race? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, the answer is yes, um, all the time. <laughs> Yes, all the time. Um, it's too—it's too much of a quip to say um, you're certainly not white enough, and unfrequently you're not black enough. Um, but as I suggested in the talk, part of what's new for someone like me who was born in the 50s, a time when there wasn't even a phrase like mixed race identity, it didn't exist anywhere um, that I knew about. Um, that it's been my students who have taught me about this new way of thinking about an old identity, right? I always knew that I came from people who were said to be of different races, um, but when I started teaching a course on um, race and marriage and the law, um, maybe you have this experience in your classes, your professor goes around and says, okay, it's the first day, tell us a little bit about why you're here, what your expectation is. And almost to a student, my students went around and said, you know, I'm a mixed race person, I come from a mixed race family, I'm in an interracial relationship, and that's why students were coming, by and large, to my course. And there was a day when, after the students went around, I heard myself say, me too, me too. And in a way, I realized I had found a new sort of community, right? A community of people whose experiences more closely paralleled mine, um, and um, with whom um, I could share the first version of some of these stories um, because they had stories of their own. Um, and that gave me a kind of courage. Isn't that funny to think of your professors as you know, getting courage from you? Um, but in fact, it gave me a kind of courage then to talk to my peers, to stand in front of rooms like this and talk about my own identity in these terms. Um, so yeah, lots of heartache, I got a million stories, um, but also it's a story about change over time in our, in our country's thinking about race and that for me has been very powerful. Thanks. Hi. In your closing story, you you were calm to the officer and you were kind. Did it take you back to when you hid your birth certificate back mm -hmm. in your drawer? Yeah. Thank you for the question. Um, what's going on in my head when that officer comes to the window? Um, a, a couple of things are going through my head. One is um, 
I'm really worried about the boys in the back seat. Right? I think in this car, in this scene, the boys in the back seat who really um, only know something right, about what might unfold or what could unfold, I'm worried about them. So that's the first thing I'm thinking about. And then I'm thinking in an odd way, um, I'm going to play along with his misapprehension of me, right? That what I'm not going to do right, to say, oh, officer, you've got it all wrong. I know we don't put race on driver's licenses anymore, but let me tell you, you think... No, right? So in that moment, um, so I, when I say that, I think, oh, gosh, I don't want you to think I was passing. But maybe I was, right? Maybe I was. Maybe I thought the safest thing to do right, in that scene was to play along with the officer's misapprehension and to offer him up right, an encounter with a respectable, reasonable white woman um, that would reassure him enough to let us go and on our way to the vineyard, right? Um, contrasted to my beloved cousin on my right who's boiling, right? The, the steam is coming out of her head. Um, yeah, so is that passing? It might be, right? And passing is one of those um, phenomena, right? Light-skinned, mixed race, people of African descent who pose and present themselves as white for advantage, right? Be it um, a job, a, a social circle, um, a church community. The stories are legion about that, and it usually is a pejorative, right? It's usually, um, um, it's usually a pejorative to mark someone as passing. But I think for the first time, I can say, I, I think I was passing, and I thought it was strategically important to do that um, and to get us out of there rather than belabor some point about my self-actualization with a police officer who clearly is not interested in that. Thanks. Um, hello. Hi. My question is, why is it important that we fill out a census where we have to check the box? Because I think I'm liking the French idea where we don't have to check a box. So why is it important in the U.S.? What data is gained and why does the U.S. need to have that information? Why is that important? It's a great question. And um, my husband, wherever he is is, is, is saying, bravo, bravo. He would like to know the answer to that, too. I think there are a few answers. Um, one is that our census dates back to the 18th century um, when there was less, not no, but there was less critical thinking about the, um, the pejorative or the downsides of asking questions about race. Right? Nobody in the 1790s was worried um, that we were, in a sense, um, reinforcing or instantiating, instantiating racism into the nation by asking those questions. So partly it comes out of history, out of habit. Um, but the real answer in the 21st century um, is the drawing of the lines of congressional districts. We use that data um, as one shorthand for thinking about, as we do every 10 years, how to draw the lines around voting communities, how we elect members to the House of Representatives, and those who do that work think about race. Um, they think about it in a range of ways, no doubt, but there is an open question about the degree to which we can use the drawing of congressional lines, for example, to empower voters of color, um, to make it more likely that, for example, but not only African Americans um, might be elected um, from majority black districts in larger numbers. So we use that race data um, in a very deliberate way still in our political system system. And then um, anybody in this room who's um, even dabbled in the social science of sociology or political science of history would tell you um, that we use that demographic data um, to do all sorts of work, including the work of thinking about discrimination um, and measuring discrimination. One of the dilemmas for a place like France is that when they confront the experiences of people said to have been discriminated against on the basis of race, they don't have the kind of demographic data that might inform um, and reinforce those kinds of analyses because they simply don't have the numbers. Um, they're not willing to go there because they think it's heading down the wrong path, um, but we can see the way in which those numbers work to arguably help us think in quite uh, quantitative terms about discrimination.
Hi. Hi, Dr. Jones. Thank you for coming out. You brought up for you brought up about how there was a disparate impact whenever there was high school graduation rates that you had uh, or that your family had challenged. But I'm curious to wonder about the disparate difference between Asians and whites and Jews and whites because Asians do accomplish more than whites through higher income, higher loan receiving, higher graduation rates, and isn't how can we attribute race to disparate impacts whenever there's multiple variances such as geography, origin, culture, and other facts of the matter? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a great question and, and partly my story um, is um, very much situated in a historical moment when we were more likely to think and analyze race in American black and white terms, right? And thinking today we would say it's not possible to only understand race through terms like black and white or categories like black and white um, that Asian, Native American, Latino, Hispanic, and all of those mixed categories are as salient to understand. So um, it's a good point about my story that it doesn't really account for that. But to your question about Asian Americans, I, I would say um, two things. Um, one is an anecdote. You may know that um, Harvard University has just been um, sued by a coalition um, that includes um, Asian American students um, who um, have made the argument that they are being discriminated against by Harvard in its admissions policy, that in fact Harvard's admissions policies include a kind of quota for white American students today um, and Asian American students are disadvantaged at a place like Harvard because their numbers um, are capped. So there's a real conversation, there's a real live debate about that question. The other thing I'd say, I think, is that um, in thinking about race and take a look when you get to 2020, you'll remember we had this conversation and look at the census, or look back at 2010. Um, Asian is a very um, capacious category um, that um, masks a great deal of difference among and between people said to be of Asia. Right? Um, that is to say, um, often when we in, use the term Asian, we're thinking Chinese Americans, Japanese Americans, perhaps South Asian Americans, um, but we're not thinking about Americans um, who are descendants of people from Southeast Asia, for example, and those demographics look very different. Um, on everything from wealth to education to life expectancy. And so that's a moment in which I'd argue, right, the taking a part of categories demographically and otherwise is really important because the difference between people from Japan and those from Cambodia, for example, are vast within a community that we might term Asian. So um, the Asian American, um, the notion politically, legally, um, has its origins in the 1980s, and um, often people often point to the murder of a, a Chinese American man in Detroit named Vincent Chin um, as the spark that creates the idea of Asian Americans and a sort of pan Asian um, political identity. Um, but it's a category um, that um, the myth, if you will, that all Asians um, excel, that all Asians achieve, that all Asians earn, um, really masks some profound inequalities among and between Asian Americans. Um, and that's some of the work that we could talk about also. So I hope that's a beginning for thinking about it. But go back and remember me in 2020 and look at the way in which the census actually breaks down the Asian category into many, many subcategories precisely because demographers and social scientists are trying to think differentially about the experiences among and between different communities of Asian Americans. So it's a great question. Thank you. Oh, hi. Speaking locally, and you can see it also in national trends. Am I hearing you? Um, is it on? Nice um, looking locally and then also stepping out and looking at national trends, we see that a lot of our communities, particularly school systems, are still just as segregated as they've ever been or perhaps even worse now. Um, how many of the problems in policing can you trace back to just a lack of interaction? Yeah. 
It's a great question. Um, how many problems um, related to policing can you um, attribute, in a sense, to the segregation in housing and our lack of interaction? Um, it's a great question. I think that that is still part of the story. Um, you know, I come from a city, New York City, where um, there is always a live debate about whether or not our police officers should be required, for example, to live in the city that they police, um, or can police officers police New York City um, and live in suburban, predominantly white enclaves? Um, and I'm, it's a debate in many American cities, this question about um, community, about contact, about knowingness. On the other hand, I think some of the most uh, interesting and, and important work in thinking about police encounters is now um, work that comes out of psychology and is working on the notion of unconscious bias. And maybe some of you have have um, uh, done some of the um, online tests that Harvard University has made available where we all can be measured um, in our quick reactions to um, faces on the screen. I see p people nodding. You've tried these. I've tried them too. And they're kind of devastating. Right, I don't know about you, but they're kind of devastating. Um, and so this question about how to get at unconscious bias, um, I think, is the one we're confronting now in those split-second encounters that are so dramatic and so grave. Um, we still need great thinking about, um, it seems that even when we seem to know each other, um, we carry stereotypes. Um, and we're, we, we act on those stereotypes. And that seems thorny, um, but very important. And there is a great um, intersection between legal scholars and psychologists precisely on this point um, who are trying to think through what that means then, um, not only for police, but for prosecutors, for jurors, right? And a whole panoply of folks in legal culture um, who likely, um, like nearly all of us, carry unconscious bias with us all the time. I think the best work is that interdisciplinary work today. Thank you again, Dr. Jones.